Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Gieske, and this is The Limiting Factor. This is the sixth and final video of the Tesla Gigacasting series. Over the past six months, I've walked you through what Gigacasting is and how it works, the crash worthiness of Gigacastings, the economics and competitors, how Gigacasting fits with the Cybertruck, and the science and engineering behind Tesla's aluminum alloy. In this video, I'll run through the key arguments leveled at Gigacastings from my original Gigacasting video, and my response to those arguments after doing several months of research. That'll be followed by my thoughts on Gigacasting as a part of Tesla's larger manufacturing plan, the possibility of larger Gigapresses and what they'd be used for, and the importance of Gigacastings for manufacturing. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. After the first video I made on Gigacastings, one of the best questions I received about Gigacastings was, what are the drawbacks? There were also quite a few comments stating that the analysis was too superficial. That was all fair criticism and feedback. At that point, I'd only done a shallow dive into gigacasting. Now, after two solid months of research and half a dozen videos over six months, let's review the criticisms of gigacastings and why they don't hold water. Criticism number one. A large number of people have said that gigacastings will increase repair costs. But that argument's been dismantled by both myself and Monroe and Associates. I made a standalone video on the topic which shows that Tesla has incorporated crush cans for minor accidents. And if the gigacasting is damaged, it's likely that the vehicle was in a serious accident and a write-off anyways. Monroe and Associates provided their insights in a review of Giga Berlin. One of their key points was that Tesla's driver's assist system will be so advanced that accidents will be rare. That is, even if repairs are expensive, the fact that Teslas will likely experience 90% fewer accidents will easily make up for the cost. Furthermore, what's more important, cheap repairs or saving your life? Gigacastings will be far more robust to high energy impacts, which will increase survivability. Criticism number two. Gigacasting can be copied because gigacasting machines are available and anyone can analyze Tesla's alloy and copy it. While that's true to a certain extent, it's a red herring. Ultimately, the broader argument here is that other automakers will catch up to Tesla and create a quote, Tesla killer. Tesla doesn't just stop after an improvement. They keep moving the ball forward. What else do they have in their skunk works like gigacasting? And how much can Tesla improve on gigacasting? Occasionally, other OEMs do implement a feature, design, or engineering in their vehicles that's impressive or thoughtful. But those bursts of value creation are isolated incidents and reflect the diligence and inspiration of a small group of people. To compete with Tesla, it requires an entire organization of people like that who aren't bogged down by bureaucracy. That is, although it's true that gigacasting in Tesla's alloy can be copied and will be copied, Tesla's already years ahead on gigacasting and will have improved upon it by the time other automakers achieve what Tesla had already achieved two years ago. Tesla will continue to improve their alloy, their casting designs, and to squeeze more out of the gigapress than other manufacturers. Criticism number three. Tesla's alloy was easy to create, anyone can do it with the right software, and the alloy isn't unique. None of these criticisms are accurate. Creating a new alloy isn't easy. Modeling software helps, but modeling software is a model, and reality is trickier. After you've used modeling to generate alloy options, you need to actually combine the metals in real life, melt them down, and test them. And it's not just a few, it's hundreds of options to thin out. This leaves the question of whether the alloy is unique. Before I cover that, I want to clarify a few things from the alloy patent video. I think some people walked away with the impression that I was saying that other automakers couldn't develop a similar alloy. There's no reason why they couldn't make a similar alloy or copy the alloy. That's how any industry develops. One player comes up with a great idea, others make an analog, or straight up copy the idea if they can get away with it. Other manufacturers have been making large cast parts for decades, but gigacastings are in another league entirely. 
For example, there was an all-aluminum vehicle created about a hundred years ago called the Pierce Arrow, but it wasn't economically viable because it used a sand casting process that couldn't hit high production rates. That is, large cast parts didn't hit the mainstream in the past because they didn't pass the AND test and therefore weren't on par with gigacastings. This is the AND test, a casting weight of 70 kilograms or more, AND a rate of over 100,000 castings a year, AND doesn't require a heat treatment, AND doesn't require coatings. As per my gigacasting economics video, this is what it takes to be competitive with advanced high strength steel. The competitive pressure from advanced steels is a large part of why we haven't seen greater use of aluminum in vehicles. Gigacasting changes those dynamics and makes aluminum a viable alternative to advanced high strength steel. On that note, if gigacasting has advantages over steel, why didn't other OEMs see the opportunity of gigacastings and act on it first? I lay the blame directly on the shoulders of managers and executives. The number of times I've seen good ideas killed by self-serving careerists and large bureaucracies is only exceeded by the number of times I've seen stupid ideas forced on productive workers like drugged Kool-Aid. I'm a fanboy of not doing things the stupid way, and Tesla clearly employs more managers with the right mindset than legacy OEMs. We're all stupid in some way. The right mindset is to acknowledge our own stupidity and learn from it. With that rant out of the way, let's get back to whether the alloy is unique. The patent reviewer indicated that the aluminum alloy appeared to be unique. Tesla hasn't received a patent for the alloy yet, but the findings of the patent reviewer are a positive signal. Furthermore, my view is that Tesla would have checked for something on the market before going through all the hassle of developing an alloy in-house. And, therefore, the alloy is likely one that's not commercially available and probably unique. I say probably because although the alloy Tesla is currently using in their gigacastings is slightly different from the patent application, it's close enough that it could be covered by the patent application. Criticism number four. Tesla's alloy will chip, crack, corrode from road salt, experience galvanic corrosion, or expand and contract too much. Tesla solved the chipping and cracking problem with their ductile and strong alloy paired with vacuum casting in their gigapress. Vacuum casting evacuates air from the dye chamber before the molten aluminum is injected, which reduces porosity. Reduced porosity means fewer weak points in the castings, which results in parts that are less brittle. Tesla solved potential corrosion issues with their alloy by using high levels of aluminum, low levels of copper, and high levels of manganese. This combination of metals should reduce reactivity. With regards to galvanic corrosion, that is, reactions with other metals, Elon stated in the past that Tesla's team takes into account galvanic corrosion. In other words, the engineers at Tesla aren't a bunch of yahoos slapping metals together. They know what they're doing. With regards to expansion and contraction issues, aluminum expands at 23 microns per degree Celsius per meter, which means just over a millimeter of expansion or contraction per meter of material for a 50 degree Celsius swing in temperature. For a two meter wide part, that would only be plus or minus one millimeter. One millimeter of expansion or contraction would have little effect on the broader vehicle structure. That is, the gigacasting won't start popping bolts or fracture when it gets cold out. Criticism number five, gigacastings will cost too much because aluminum is expensive. Aluminum is more expensive than steel, but that's only part of the story. Aluminum gains a lot of ground in terms of cost per part because it's lower density and can be made thicker for the same weight of material, and thickness provides rigidity. But even taking that into account, aluminum still ends up costing about 30% more per part than steel after all production costs are accounted for. This is where gigacasting comes in to level the playing field. Part of the reason that aluminum parts are expensive is because aluminum typically requires expensive manufacturing steps such as heat treatments and coatings. That is, the high material cost plus the high process costs are what makes aluminum expensive to use in products. Tesla's alloy and gigacasting technology eliminate the expensive manufacturing steps. Let's take a closer look. Heat treatments are used to strengthen aluminum parts. They're high cost because they're energy intensive. They can also warp the part, which can generate scrap, which can also add cost. 
Tesla's Giga Castings use their in-house cast aluminum alloy and vacuum casting to create strength, which eliminates the need for heat treatment and eliminates warping. As for coating, as I said earlier, the alloy is corrosion resistant, which eliminates the need for protective coatings typically used to protect cast aluminum parts from corrosion. Again, this is one less manufacturing step which would typically require machines, floor space, time, and chemicals. Finally, of course, the sheer size of Tesla's castings reduce manufacturing costs because Tesla can cast one giant part. This is as opposed to typical aluminum castings that would need to be joined, or steel stampings that require massive presses and hundreds of robotic welders for joining. Joining processes can involve thousands of welds, whereas Tesla can just punch out a casting, trim it, and it's ready to go into a vehicle. After taking into account all the cost factors related to stamped steel and cast aluminum, it appears that GigaCast vehicles are, conservatively, about $100 cheaper per vehicle. That doesn't sound like much, but as we'll see later in the video, part-level cost savings don't tell the whole story. Criticism number six. Tesla's alloy uses a fair amount of silicon, which eats into steel dyes, meaning the dyes for the gigacasting machines will need to be replaced often, generating cost. This doesn't hold water for me because Tesla uses dye release agents in their alloy along with vegetable oil sprayed on the dyes between each casting, like a waffle iron. They're probably also using dyes that have surface modifications such as nitriding to harden the dye and extend its life. That is, due to the dye release agents in the alloy itself, the dye surface modifications to prevent against wear and tear, and the sacrificial oil coating used between the alloy and the dye surface, the gigacastings likely won't stick or exfoliate when removed from the casting machine, which should ensure long dye life. There are quite a few more arguments against gigacasting, but most of them are variants of the six covered above. If you're still curious or have doubts, I've addressed these arguments much more thoroughly in other videos in the series. This video is a high-level recap of those videos. Assuming that gigacastings cost the same or slightly less than a stamped steel body, how much more quickly does gigacasting allow the vehicle manufacturing line to move, and how much additional revenue will that generate? This is a question that only people in Tesla would know the answer to, and it's likely different with each new manufacturing line they build. As each part of a manufacturing line is optimized, the bottleneck shifts. However, what we do know is that Elon said this at Battery Day. Quote, the company that will be successful is the company that with one factory can accomplish what other companies take two or three or four factories to do. End quote. That is, gigacasting is part of a more ambitious long-term goal. How's Tesla going with that goal? Herbert D, CEO of VW, has said that it takes VW 30 hours to produce an ID3, whereas it will take Tesla only 10 hours to produce a Model 3 at Giga Berlin. VW is targeting 20 hours in 2022, with a longer-term target of 16 hours. That is, according to Dees, Tesla is producing vehicles in half the time that VW is. This means that late this year or early next year in Berlin, Tesla will be producing twice as many vehicles per vehicle line as VW. The gigacasting will be a large part of that because of the hundreds of robots it eliminates and the greater precision it creates for each part, which has a ripple effect that smooths and accelerates the production down the rest of the manufacturing line. Let's move on to gigapress output and larger gigapresses. Idra, which is one of Tesla's gigapress suppliers, advised a maximum rate of 1,000 castings per day, which would be 365,000 castings per year. That, of course, didn't include downtime and defective parts. So what production rate can we expect? In my original gigacasting video, I said that it appeared Tesla was achieving a production rate of up to 180,000 castings per year and could eventually hit a production rate of 250,000 castings per year. Handelman Post has been tracking gigacastings more closely and is seeing a rate of 125,000 castings per year per gigapress, which is about a third of the theoretical maximum of 365,000. Can Tesla double that 125,000 annual part rate and hit the 250,000 per year I suggested? We'll have to wait and see, but it appears Tesla is looking for ways to increase the casting rate. 
Last week, when I toured Giga Texas, I asked the production engineers what the limiting factor for the Giga Press was. They said heat. I then asked if they could improve the cooling rate. The engineer simply said, Do you see any differences between these two machines? At that point, my jaw dropped because it appeared that Tesla is scrapping the typical cooling system used for the Gigapress, which uses a series of boxy thermal regulation units. Instead, there were several large tanks. I'm not sure what's in these tanks or how they work to accelerate cooling. For me, the key takeaway is that Tesla just isn't stopping. Every time they hit a manufacturing or speed bottleneck, they push through it to accelerate speed and reduce cost. If I find out more about these tanks, I'll let you know. After maxing out line speed, what's next? Go larger. Tesla's gigapresses currently have about 6,000 tons of clamping force, and Tesla has an 8,000 ton gigapress for the Cybertruck on order. There's also a 9,000 ton press that was just produced that's assumed to be for Tesla. Either way, beyond 8 or 9,000 tons, Alex Voigt has received information from a credible source that Tesla is investigating a 12,000 ton gigapress. What's bigger than a Cybertruck casting? A lot of people have been saying that Tesla will cast an entire vehicle, and a 12,000 ton gigapress might be able to do that. However, the words cast an entire vehicle are terribly imprecise. It makes for a great headline, but what does it actually mean? We run into the same issue with Elon's comments at Giga Berlin. Elon said a full body casting would be unwise, but we don't know what he means by full body casting. It's pretty broad terminology. That is, there's still a lot of uncertainty here, so I'm going to speculate. Giga castings are currently used for front and rear underbody castings, which are the load-bearing structure at the front and rear of the vehicle. Between the castings sits the structural battery pack. It's best if the structural battery pack is made from stamped steel because steel has a higher melting temperature than aluminum. That's a useful safety feature if the batteries in the pack ignite. The next structural element that could be cast would be the structural floor pan. The structural floor pan is a large, ribbed sheet of metal that forms the floor of the passenger cabin that provides torsional rigidity. In past Tesla vehicles, this was a redundant structure above the battery pack. However, with the new structural battery pack, there's no longer a structural floor pan because the structural battery is providing torsional rigidity. The structural battery serves as the floor and the seats are mounted directly to it. The only structural elements left in the vehicle body after accounting for the underbody castings and structural battery pack is the frame formed by the roof rails, rockers, and pillars. I don't see any reason why these couldn't be cast, and that might make sense because they could extend naturally from the existing front and rear underbody castings. This would mean most of the core structure of the vehicle could be cast for a small vehicle, like the upcoming compact Tesla or RoboTaxi. However, those vehicles sound like they're a year or more away from being officially announced, which often means another year before production. So ordering a 12,000 ton press now might be premature, but I don't know the lead time required for these presses. In addition to the structural parts of the vehicle, there are also the non-structural parts such as the body panels and hood. Does casting an entire vehicle mean casting those parts as well? I don't think so, and here's why. First, most people prefer the look of a painted vehicle and aluminum is more expensive to paint than steel, so steel makes more sense for the frame and body panels. That is, I don't see the non-structural parts of Tesla's vehicles like body panels being cast. Second, additionally, the body panels don't make sense for gigacasting anyways because body panels have to be separate pieces so you can open the doors. That is, casting them wouldn't significantly reduce part count, and reducing part count in complex assemblies is one of the main reasons for gigacasting. Now that we've covered off the possibilities for a full body casting, it's worth considering two other use cases for a 12,000 ton gigapress. First, Tesla could move to casting both the front and rear underbody with one machine. That is, one machine pumping out underbody sets of front and rear underbodies rather than separate machines for each the front and rear underbody, which is what Tesla is currently doing. The second option would be that a 12,000 ton machine could be for parts for the Tesla Semi, which is expected to go into full-scale production in 2023. 
Personally, I like the semi idea more, but only because I want to see how big of a casting Tesla can make with the Gigapress. The only vehicle in Tesla's fleet that could accept a larger casting than the Cybertruck is the semi. Finally, some people were disappointed with the unit costs I laid out in the Gigacasting Economics video. However, not everything is about cost per part per vehicle. As Sandy Monroe often says, don't save me money, I can't afford it. Product design makes up 5% of the cost of a vehicle, but has the opportunity to influence the end cost of the vehicle by 70%. Many companies try to save cost by pinching pennies. That is, squeezing suppliers, grinding their workers to dust, and deferring maintenance that shouldn't be deferred. In reality, the best way to save money is by creating a product that can be manufactured easily. Even if some parts in the vehicle cost more, those so-called expensive parts reduce downtime, increase throughput, and increase quality. That is, focusing on quality and ease of manufacturing reduces failure costs, which can be enormous. Failure costs can include issues that are found before the vehicle leaves the factory that create rework, and issues after the vehicle leaves the factory, such as warranty repairs and recalls. Many companies end up kneecapping the output of their factories because they aren't looking at the production line holistically. That means fewer vehicles are sold at lower quality, which means lower revenue and higher failure costs. Gigacasting should nearly eliminate failure costs related to the body, such as noise, vibration, and harshness, leaks, and parts that don't fit correctly. I've worked in car dealerships before and watched mechanics spend a full day or more tearing apart a vehicle to find a leak or rattle. Those teardowns usually occurred after an increasingly exasperated customer had paid several visits to the dealership. With a gigacasting, after it's removed from the gigapress, it might undergo a quality check, but after that it's rock solid and precise to well below one millimeter, and there may be no need for further quality control checks. Every part bolted onto the gigacasting will find a precise fit every time. That's a huge improvement over a conventional body assembly process, which involves dozens of stampings welded together by hundreds of robots, which makes up around 30% of a typical vehicle production line, and would probably have several quality control checks throughout the body assembly process. Then, at the end of body assembly, you might still have a body that's imperfect, with panel gaps, squeaks, leaks, or rattles. In summary, despite the naysayers and noise around gigacasting, it appears poised to disrupt vehicle body manufacturing. Gigacasting will accelerate the speed of vehicle manufacturing lines and reduce the amount of floor space and capital needed for each factory, which will allow Tesla to ramp at a sustained rate of above 50% growth per year, and possibly more if the rest of the supply chain can keep up. Those manufacturing lines will not only be higher speed, but also produce a higher quality product. That not only benefits the end customer, but will allow Tesla to reduce the number of quality checks in the factory and reduce the number of service centers and technicians needed to service Tesla vehicles while the company scales. It also means the customer will get a lighter and tighter product. By tighter, I mean that the massive reduction in parts and welds will make for a better vehicle ride with fewer chances of squeaks and rattles. The lighter weight means higher efficiency. Higher efficiency means more mileage per watt of energy, which means fewer batteries required per vehicle and lower CO2 emissions. If fewer batteries are required per vehicle, Tesla can put more vehicles on the road than any other manufacturer with the same number of cells while doing so at a lower cost. If reality lines up with what I've learned creating this series, then gigacasting is the best way to produce a vehicle underbody full stop. There doesn't appear to be any major drawbacks. Gigacasting is an exceedingly elegant and simple solution that's superior to conventional stamped steel bodies. You can expect other forward-thinking companies to follow suit, particularly Chinese companies. But you can also expect Tesla to keep pushing at the edges of the technology to maintain their lead in manufacturing. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to Cybertron, Fon Tomas, and Gary Heaton for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for tuning in.